dollars. If you're interested in joining. If you figure out how to do that, please let me know. I'd be very <laughs> curious. Yeah, sometimes you read the news and you um, really feel how audacious people can be. But um, I think if we're just going to come into the here and now and the topics that really matter for humanity, let's talk about large language models and AI systems and chat GPT more specifically. I want to start off, Sam, by asking you what drives you to create these systems? Why did you embark on this journey? And you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Look, we, we have a long way to go and a lot to prove, but I think if we can get, if we can fulfill our mission, uh, if we can even get close to it, the, the benefits to humanity of making intelligence broadly available, uh, inexpensive, and sort of as a tool to let humanity build the future, I think is quite remarkable. I think abundant intelligence and closely related to that abundant energy can unlock a future that is, is, is sort of difficult for me to even imagine how, how good it could be. Uh, and I think right now we don't realize how limited we are um, by the limits on intelligence and how expensive it is and how difficult it is. But if you imagine a world where everyone gets a great personal tutor, great personalized medical advice, we can use these tools to discover all sorts of new science, cure diseases, help the environment, discover new physics, who knows what else. Uh, I think that's pretty remarkable. And also, just speaking personally, I think this is like the most exciting quest frontier I can imagine being on. And, and how close are we to the vision? If you're going to talk about the drug discovery, curing cancer, using um, not chat GPT, but large language models to try to solve some of the biggest physics questions, chemistry questions, biology questions of our lives. How far off are we? So the honest answer, of course, is, is we really don't know. You know, this is new science. We're discovering new things all, of, all of the time. The rate of discovery is incredible. The rate of change is incredible, but it, it's sort of hard to know exactly how far we have to go. What I will say, though, is we hear all the time from scientists who say that our tools make them much more productive. And they don't have an easy way to quantify that, but they say it's substantial. We also don't know how much that difference, you know, if you could make every scientist on Earth twice as productive, what that would mean for the rate of scientific discovery, because this is all so new. This is like, you know, a little bit more than a year old, but we'll find out. So uh, I'd like to just um, touch upon the UAE's experience here, because we did talk about this when we were together in person a few weeks yeah. ago. Uh, we've seen that the deployment of large language models and chat GPT in specific actually did not increase cheating rates in universities. It was actually a great enabler for students, for professors. We've seen as well that when the government embraces these systems and talks about them positively, the public utilizes them in the right way. So we launched a guide to help people understand how to use these tools effectively and how to be more productive with them, as well as probably put some guidelines against what they shouldn't be used for. What is the best government application that you've seen? What's something that you think uh, is, a, is a model for other governments to follow in this domain? So, first of all, you, you touched on something that you sort of glossed over, but I want to I want to spend a second on it because I think it's informative to what's happening, um, which was about education and cheating in schools. And when ChatGPT first came out, uh, you know, the whole world had a moment of adjustment. But the first thing that happened is, at least in the United States, in my experience school districts were falling all over themselves to ban ChatGPT the fastest and declare you know, this existential threat to education. And other people got concerned later, but it really started with education. Education was also the place it reversed the quickest. Teachers and school districts embraced it and said, you know, hey, this is part of the future. This is something that we all want. This is going to help our students learn better. And I, I really believe this will be the most, this already is, uh, and certainly will be, one of the most transformative technologies for education we've had in, in recent times. And I think that leads into your question well about governments, because there are all of these things that people were afraid of or maybe are still afraid of about large language models and AI. But governments who embrace it and say, let's find ways to help this deliver services for our citizens better. Let's think about ways we can reform how the government does its job, how people fill out forms or do whatever they need to do, how the government helps provide education, health care, as we discussed earlier. That seems to be working really well. And the governments that are saying, let's lean in, let's experiment with this, let's embrace it, let's, you know, make it available to our government, to our citizens. That, I think, is the best thing to do right now. 
and just say like, hey, we're all figuring this out together, we're all writing the rule book together, but let's lean in and try it. There's um, a thought that says you have ChatGPT 3, which blew people away. You had 3.5, which was a huge improvement. You have GPT-4, that also took us to the next level, and now you're working on GPT-5. The proliferation of this technology is still limited, so we're still using it in a very specific domain, very specific use cases. We haven't really seen the proper applications that are world-changing. Why are we continuing to push across the bigger, the better, uh, you know, the, the larger models that we're seeing right now. What's the logic behind that? Can you explain that to us? Well, I think for that exact reason, as you said, we have not yet seen as much world-changing uh, application as we'd like. Maybe we've seen some. Um, there are a lot of people who use these services and get value out of them, but, but not as much as we'd like. And, and I think the reason is um, the current technology that we have is like, I mean, it's like that very first cell phone with the black and white screen that can only display those like numbers and, you know, it just didn't do much. But there was enough in there, you're like, hmm, I can make a call, that's, that's cool. And at the time, that seems great. And then it took us, I don't know how long from that, but many decades from that to the iPhones we have today. And the thing we have today is incredible. And it took a massive amount of scaling in all these different ways to get there. Um, but we have now is like unimaginable at the time of those like first primitive cell phones. And I think that's, that's why we have to push forward. We're at this barely useful cell phone, but people still like making phone calls, it turns out. And if you can make a better way for them to do it so they can go walk around the world while they do it, sure, that's great. But that's not what we want to deliver. We want to deliver the iPhone 16 or 15 or whatever the current one is. And what's the timeline to reach the iPhone 16 from the current Motorola that we have? You gotta give us, you gotta be a little patient. That's like a, a, you know, it took the world a while to do that last time around. So give us some time. But I will say, I think in a few more years, it'll be much better than it is now. And in a decade, it should be pretty remarkable. Uh, and if we're going to compare um, GPT-4 to GPT-5, uh, because you're at the cusp of this, you're actually seeing it at the forefront. What is the difference? Like if I'm excited about GPT-5, what should I be excited about? I, I, I was sort of laughing a little bit because this is going to sound like an annoying answer, but I think it is the important part. It's going to be smarter. There are all of these other things, you know, we can talk about, it'll be better at these kind of tasks, it'll be multimodal, it'll be faster, what, what, you know, who knows what. But the, the thing that I think really matters is it's going to be smarter. And this is a bigger deal than it sounds, right? Because what, what makes these models so magical is that they're, they're general. Um, and so if it's a little bit better, if it's a little bit smarter, that means it's a little bit better at everything. And the thing that I think is most exciting is it's not like this model is going to get a little better at this task and not really better at these or, you know, it's not that. It's, it's because we're going to make the model smarter, it's going to be better at everything across the board. Have you watched the movie Freaky Friday where these two people switch places? I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it. So, so the, the thesis or the idea of the movie was two people switched places. They moved into different bodies, and they lived each other's lives. Let's assume today is um, Freaky Tuesday, and you become the Minister of Artificial Intelligence of the UAE. If you were going to take one regulatory decision for this country, knowing what you know, seeing what you see, what would you do? Does that mean you have to take my job for a day? I would, I would love to do that, just for a day. You have fun with that. It's not as easy as it looks. No, no, I know it's very hard, but I'd um, love to experience it. That'd be great. Um, anytime you want to switch, I, I, I will <laughs> greatly look forward to that. Um, what I would do, uh... That was a curveball, by the way. No, 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 it's a, it's a really thoughtful question. I'm trying to give a thoughtful answer. Um, I, I think... What I would do is try to, and I know you've done some work in this direction and I, I really appreciate it, but I, I would try to find a way to create more of a regulatory sandbox where people could experiment with this technology and, and, and be able to figure out sort of like dream, imagine, whatever you want to call it, what the world could look like. Um, and then I would try to see what makes sense and what doesn't and write the regulation around that. I think it's very hard, I think we have to try, and we're going to anyway, but I think it's very hard to get all of the regulatory ideas right in a vacuum. Um, 
And if there was a sort of a contained way that I could find a way to like give people the future and let them experiment it with it, uh, and then see what made sense, uh, what what went really wrong, well and really right, and write the regulation around that. That that seems like an interesting experiment. So I have great news. Um, we already have a platform here called the Reg Lab that does that. The only issue is, I think it hasn't proliferated yet to be truly global. Um, one thing that I think we should do is actually look at how we can take it to the next level and use a specific use case there for AI rather than just broad technologies, right? Can I change my answer? I thought more. You can change your answer a hundred times. Go I on. I still think that's a good thing to do, but since I only have one day, a better thing to do. Okay. Um, one thing that I have been thinking about, so the world is going to try all of these different regulatory approaches. There will be your sandbox. I think it's awesome that you have that. Other people do other things. Um, but we are going to, and I, I think that's actually really good, but we are going to need, I believe, at some point, some sort of global system. Um, the example that I've given in the past is the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, for what happens with the most powerful of these systems, because they will have truly global impact. And what sort of auditing, what sort of safety measures do we want in place before you can deploy uh, like a super intelligence or you know, however you want to call an AGI. And I think for a bunch of reasons, the UAE would be so well set up to be a leader in the discussions around that. I would, I would like host a one day conference with leaders from around the world to brainstorm about that. Consider it done. We'll do it. Um, okay. Thank you. I'd love to come. Uh, I'd like to just move on to the regulatory issue. So um, I remember the first time we had this conversation on artificial intelligence, on regulating AI, the dangers, the opportunities was, if I'm not mistaken, was it 2017 uh, that we met in LA when um, yes. you hosted that? Or 16. Either one 16 or 17, one of those years. And, and we were having a discussion, and you actually uh, put forward a vision for AI that's going to change the world, alongside Elon Musk and a few others. And you also mentioned some of the dangers. There are a lot of efforts today on regulation. There are efforts by the UN. There are efforts by the G20, by the G7, and others. In terms of these efforts, are they hitting the mark, you think? Is there something else that we need to do? We have a lot of people here that represent international organizations and that represent governments. What more should we do? And if it's doing well, how can we make it even better? Frankly speaking, I think we're still on the stage, and this is not necessarily bad, but we're still on the stage of a lot of discussion. So there's, you know, everybody in the world is having a conference, everybody's got an idea, a policy paper, and that's okay. I think we're still at a time where debate is needed and healthy. But at some point in the next few years, I think we have to move towards like an action plan with, with real buy-in around the world. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like exactly what is, what is necessary to make that happen? I honestly don't think that is for OpenAI to say. Um, I mean, we have a lot of ideas. We've tried to contribute them to the discussion. I think a lot of other people have a lot of ideas. This is a big thing. Like, this is going to touch all of us, and this is going to... I, I am very high conviction that we can manage our way through this, but it's going to take a great deal of collaboration, um, and it's going to take the, our leaders of the world coming together. And, you know, it's, that's, I think, not for us to set. Uh, maybe um, another thing that we can just jump to quickly. Uh, if we're going to talk about governments that do not have the resources of a company like OpenAI or a country like the UAE, countries that are limited in their resources and the, um, let's say, directions that they can take on these things, what advice do you have for them on the LLM race right now? What should they do? Should they use, in your opinion, closed source or open source tools should we choose sides, or should we just go for the best application and the best utility? How would you go about this? We're giving this a lot of thought. We're trying to, you know, we want to have like an offering um, that makes sense for countries that, that want to have offer AI services. Um, but in the meantime, I think what people are doing right now, which is just sort of use these APIs or run open source models, I, I think that'll make sense. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you guys open source GPT-3. Is that correct? GPT-2 we did, I don't think 3. GPT-2, okay. Is there a sense that you guys are going to open source 
the uh, models as you launch new ones. So, for example, as five comes along, you're going to open source three. Is that something that you guys are thinking about, or is that not on the table? I think you should expect us to open source more things over time, but exactly what and when and how we're trying to figure out. There, there are like great open source models, open source language models out in the world now. And, you know, I don't think what the world needs is like another similar model. Um, so we'd like to do something that is helpful and new and we're trying to figure out what that might be. I, I'd like to now just um, jump into something that the fear mongerers and the opportunists talk about. What is the most thing that you fear when it comes to um, the deployment of AI and the most thing you're, opportuni uh, uh, you're optimistic about? Like, if I'm going to tell you what keeps you up at night and what keeps you going in the morning, give me one reason for that and one reason for the other. Um. The keep up at night is easy. It's all of the sci-fi stuff. Uh, you know, I think sci-fi writers are a very smart bunch. And in, in the decades of sci-fi about AI, uh, there have been unbelievably creative ways to imagine that how this can go wrong. And I think most of them are like comical, but there's some things in there that are easy to imagine where things really go wrong. And I'm not that interested in like the killer robots walking down the street direction of things going wrong. I'm much more interested in the like very subtle societal misalignments where we just have these systems out in society and through no particular ill intention, um, things just go horribly wrong. But the thing that wakes me up in the morning with energy every day is what I actually believe is things are just going to go tremendously right. We got to work hard to mitigate all of the, the downside cases. They are, I think, very significant and, and, and real potentials to confront. But the reason that we go think so hard about how to deploy this technology safely uh, is the upside is, is remarkable. Um, I think we can easily imagine a world in the not super distant future where everybody's got a better life than people have today. I think we can raise the standard of living so incredibly much um, if everybody has access to abundant amounts of really high quality intelligence and they can use that tool, those tools to create whatever they want to do. That's like pretty amazing. Um, I, people, I, 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 this is like kind of how I think about it, but people are like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, if you think about everybody on earth getting a, the resources of a company of like hundreds of thousands of really competent people, um, and what that would do, you know, if you have like an AI programmer, AI lawyer, um, AI marketer, AI strategist, and not just one of those, but many of each, and you get to sort of like decide how to use those, to use that to kind of create whatever you want to create, we're all going to get a lot of great stuff. The creative power of humanity with tools like that should be remarkable. So uh, that's, I think, what gets us all up every morning. My final question. Um, Let's imagine that you're sitting right now in front of a teenager in Turkey, another teenager in the Middle East somewhere, like let's say Qatar or the UAE, and uh, someone that's in Africa or Asia. And they're all asking you, what should we do in the future? How can we ensure that this doesn't take our jobs? How can we ensure that we are relevant in the AI age? How can we uh, be part of this future that you just laid out that's very optimistic, that's extremely exciting. What would you recommend they do? Should they study something as a specific domain? Should they take a certain course? Should we just play with the technology? What advice do you have for them? The first thing I would say is you are unbelievably lucky. You are coming of age at probably the best time in human history. You understand this technology. Young people are always the early adopters of technology, almost always, but certainly in this case. And you will be able to use these tools to do things that the people in the generation before you couldn't even imagine. You will, you will have your entire career uh, flooded with opportunity and the ability to do amazing new things. You'll be able to start companies that are phenomenally more impactful and successful than people the generation before you could. You will live in this incredibly expansionary opportunity, like, just flooded with a time of like massive, massive opportunity. And you can kind of go do whatever you want. 
uh, the I think the rule like the ground under us all is shifting. The rules are changing, but the amount of value that will be created and the ability for an individual to express their creative vision and will, uh, it's a great time. Thank you so much, Sam, for your time, for your insights. I would look forward to seeing you here in person in the coming cycles. Thank look you. Look forward to coming back soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Distinguished guests, our next session is titled, Will AI Lead Us to Our End? with Dr. Jan LeCun, Turing Award Laureate, Vice President, and Chief AI Scientist at Meta. This session is moderated by Nate Langson from Bloomberg. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's my very great pleasure to be here moderating this session with one of the world's foremost AI pioneers, Dr. Jan LeCun, Chief AI Scientist at Meta. And as a slight spoiler alert to answer the question posed by this session's title, uh, the answer will be no. Uh, that is what I, I anticipate this is what we'll, we'll probably be concluding. Um, now, interestingly, on this stage yesterday, the CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang, um, said that one of, if not the most significant moments over the last year in AI was the release of Llama 2, the open source model from, from Meta, and also uh, Falcon family developed here in the UAE. So can you talk to us, Jan, about open source AI? Why is open source the way forward from a security and innovation perspective? So there's going to be a, f a future, not very far in the future, where all of our interaction with the digital world are going to be mediated by AI systems. We already see this with uh, uh, companies putting out basically replacement for search engines uh, that are backed by AI systems. And so in this, in this future, if all of our digital diet is mediated by AI systems. Um, it's going to be, there's going to be a need for a, a very wide diversity of AI systems that cater to different languages, different cultures, different value systems, different centers of interest. And it, it can't be produced by a small number of companies on the west coast of the US um, um, or any single country. Uh, so essentially AI, tools, assistance, will become kind of a repository of all human knowledge. And um, it's going to be a, a kind of infrastructure. And the history shows that infrastructure software always end, ends up being open source because it's more secure, it's more customizable, uh, it enables the creation of an ecosystem on top of it. And so the, the entire infrastructure of our communication systems, the internet, um, even our cell phones, uh, uh, software stack for the, you know, communication, communicating with cell phone towers. It's all open source for very good reasons. It's not by design. It's really the, the market forces that push it. So there's a similar phenomenon which is definitely happening now in the last uh, uh, few months that Lamatou has, uh, has been available and more open source uh, LLMs have been available that people are using those open source models and, and customizing them for vertical applications in businesses, but also uh, training them for you know, particular types of uh, 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 languages or, or cultures. Uh, and so it's a necessity. We, we need it. We need free and diverse AI platforms for the same reason that we need free and diverse press. Um, so we don't have a single opinion coming to us from, from AI. Yeah, and how do you how do you manage the expectation of, of stakeholders? You know, obviously at, at Meta, I imagine there was at least one serious conversation that revolved around should we make this open source or should we not? And I'm